It lays the predicate and the foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather and he who controls the weather will control the world. The voice of protest, of warning, of appeal is never more needed than when the clamor of fife and drum echoed by the press and too often by the pulpit is bidding all men to fall in and to keep step and to obey in silence the tyrannous word of command. Then, more than ever, it is the duty of the good citizen not to be silent. A timeless quote from Charles Eliot Norton. The human race continues its headlong march toward near-term catastrophic collapse in lockstep with biosphere implosion. And it seems almost nowhere is there even the slightest consciousness of what is about to befall us all, or the malevolence of the global controllers that are driving it. But again, I ask, is it just global power structures that are to blame for the rapidly darkening horizon? The short answer is no. The clinically insane controllers can only do what they do if populations support the insanity. And sadly, the majority are continuing to do exactly that, doing exactly what they're told, blindly believing every official narrative and pretending that their lives will magically go back to, quote, normal if they do so. Taken as a whole, the human race has committed itself to a trajectory of mathematically certain, extremely near-term self-extermination. Whenever you find you're on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. A nugget of timeless wisdom from Mark Twain. To those that are not willing to hear and to consider the worst imaginable news, I have a question. How can anything possibly get any better unless or until the bad news, i.e. the most dire and immediate threats, are faced, investigated, and dealt with? An effort which will take all of us to do anything less is to turn one's back to the oncoming train, which won't save you, won't save your children or anyone else. What can we individually do to make a difference at this late hour? Stay tuned. This is Dane Wigington with geoengineeringwatch.org, the world's largest and most visited website and data repository on the subject of the ongoing global covert climate intervention operations, i.e. weather warfare. You're listening to the weekly Global Alert News broadcast, a commercial-free, non-political update on the most dire and immediate threats we collectively face. How's the wider horizon looking? That answer is already crystal clear for any that don't have their eyes wide shut. From any rational perspective, the horizon is indeed dark. How many who think they understand the CB19 scenario and the agenda behind it and the people that are part of it have taken the time to conduct objective investigation, any objective investigation whatsoever, starting with the latest data from the CDCs, the Centers for Disease Control Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, known as VAERS. The website address is vaers.hhs.gov. Or will the majority continue to do exactly what they're told without any legitimate investigation or contemplation blindly following voices like those you will hear in the next 90 seconds of audio. Listen carefully. You'll recognize some or many. No one likes to mandate people to do things that they may not want to do, but sometimes for the greater good of society, you have to do that. You got to start telling people if you don't get vaccinated, you can't come into this office or this place of business. We really make, need to make it clear that there are privileges associated with being an American. That if you wish to have these privileges, you need to get vaccinated. Travel and having the right to travel in our state—it's not a constitutional right, as far as I'm as far as I know. Getting vaccinated is not a personal choice. 
It's not. It's something that we do for the community. I think that he should approach this with an iron fist. If you don't get vaccinated, you can't come to work. People aren't then going to threaten to go to another workplace. If every workplace has that same requirement, that's a good thing. So I don't think it's overreach. I think this is what's needed in the middle of a pandemic. And in fact, I think the Biden administration, if anything, could have gone even further. And those governors that stand in the way, I think it was very clear from the president's tone today, that uh, he will run over them. If you don't get vaccinated, you can't come into this gym. Screw your freedom, because with freedom comes obligations and uh, and and responsibilities. Your personal choice ends where my right not to get killed by an infectious disease begins. So we have these collective actions for the good of the community, not the individual. We don't live in a bubble. We live in a community. And that is why there have been a number of instances throughout history where we have made a decision as a society to abide by common rules that protect the common good. We really have to uh, you know, think in terms of what is best for society at this point. If you don't get vaccinated, you can't come into this, get onto this airplane. You can stay unvaccinated if you want, but you're not going to be able to travel to see your family. We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin. There you have it. For me, current power structure puppet occupying the White House, who, like all previous puppets going back to John F. Kennedy, are carrying out the dictates of those who pull their strings. Question, how are all the mandated vaccination protocols working out so far in regard to magically making everything return to, quote, normal? Question two, if the vaccines are so safe and so effective and provide so much security, why are so many of the vaccinated so deathly fearful of those who have chosen not to get the injection. And there is always this pesky detail to consider. The total legal immunity that Big Pharma has been granted, if anything goes wrong with the injection, not their problem. But don't worry, I'm sure everyone involved with the entire CV-19 fiasco is telling the truth, right? Everything will be just fine. Just keep whistling through the graveyard. Anyway, those in power didn't really mean it when they said, on the record, for decades, that global populations needed to be radically reduced. Did they? Again, investigate. V-A-E-R-S dot H-H-S dot G-O-V. The Vaccine Adverse Reaction Reporting System. Moving on. Chicago Police Union Head urges members to defy vaccine mandate. Warns force will likely shrink to 50% this weekend. Another headline from last week, Freedom Flyers, airline industry workers fired for refusing CV-19 shot, and now they're fighting back. From that report, a group of airline professionals have banded together to fight back against mandatory COVID-19 vaccination mandates. They call themselves the U.S. Freedom Flyers. Some, perhaps many, are angry at the airline industry personnel, but is such anger justified or even rational? Question, are the airline industry companies who are pushing the vaccine mandates under pressure from the controllers of the matrix, i.e. the money printers, are they offering to in any way take care of the pilots for the rest of their lives if they, the pilots, are injured or worse by what they are being required to do? We already know the answer to that. No. No guarantees. No one is liable. You're simply told to do what you're told. Roll up your sleeve. Don't ask questions. And who's dictating this narrative? Again, the same global controllers that have repeatedly stated on the record their desire to reduce global populations. Ponder that for a while. Next headline from the Washington Post. Hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops have not yet complied with vaccine mandates as deadlines near. Let's see how that turns out. Another headline from the Texas Tribune. Texas Governor Greg Abbott bans any COVID-19 vaccine mandates, including for private employers. From that report, again from the Texas Tribune, Texas Governor Greg Abbott on Monday issued another executive order cracking down on COVID-19 vaccine mandates, this time banning any entity in Texas, including private businesses, from requiring vaccinations for employees and customers. Governor Abbott went on to say this, quote, the COVID-19 vaccine is safe and effective and our best defense against the virus, but should always remain voluntary and never forced. Sounds somewhat logical, at least the end, doesn't it? 
But again, I have this question for Mr. Abbott regarding his, quote, safe and effective claim. Again, if this is true, why have all CV-19 injection manufacturers been given total legal immunity from any and all injuries and or mortality that may be related to their creations? Why? Why isn't this fact of far greater concern to populations that don't seem to question or investigate anything they're told to do by those in power? Let's ponder this for a moment. Who would buy a new car if there were virtually no guarantee whatsoever of manufacturer liability? If the brakes fail and you drive off a cliff, your problem. If the engine explodes, your problem. If the car fails in every imaginable way, your problem. Who would buy such a car? And yet, when those that the public has been so well trained to obey without question, tell them to submit, and tell them to roll up their sleeve, and further, to take full responsibility if anything goes wrong, because the dictators in Big Pharma aren't willing to accept any responsibility, well, here we are. Question, how should we expect the controllers to react and to respond to the public's rapidly rising concerns about the individual that most represents the official controller narrative regarding CV-19? And we are told is tasked with protecting public health. The National Geographic film Fauci is an epic red flag of the degree to which the power structure is willing to back up and prop up its servants with extraordinary levels of mainstream media propaganda. If you want to know the truth about Fauci and not the carefully crafted power structure propaganda, read Robert F. Kennedy's new book, the real Anthony Fauci. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the U.S. population, in fact, many of the first world populations globally, don't want to objectively investigate the truth on countless issues. Issues like who Anthony Fauci really is, or the actual CV-19 scenario origin, or the vaccine-related statistical data, or the events of 9-11, or the climate engineering atrocities being carried out in our skies. Or that we, all of us, are facing a mathematically certain near-term total collapse of industrialized, militarized civilization. And the most unpalatable of all, and the most denied, the probable near-term extinction of our species, if we remain on the current course. Moving on to breaking headlines on that theme, on the bottom line of biosphere collapse. UN chief, United Nations chief, calls for bold action to end, quote, suicidal war with nature, end quote. From that report, Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez told leaders attending the UN Biodiversity Conference that, quote, we are losing our suicidal war against nature, end quote. The UN chief warned that humanity's reckless interference with nature will have permanent consequences. He stated that the rate of species loss, i.e. extinction, is tens to hundreds of times higher than the average of the past 10 million years, and this rate is accelerating. Let's ponder that for a moment, because what he stated is completely false. No, it's not tens to hundreds of times higher, the species extinction rate, than the background extinction rate, or as Gutierrez stated, the average rate. The current rate of extinction is approximately 15 thousand times the background rate of extinction, or a million and a half percent of normal. If that doesn't scare the hell out of you, it should. About that pesky supply chain problem making the news, no need to worry about that. It won't continue for all that long. The already unfolding total collapse will take care of it. Biosphere collapse forces societal collapse period. Nature has historically provided 75% of all global GDP for free. No more. The party's over, and it's not coming back. Yes, Wally World is still open, and you can, for the moment, still pick up and gulp down a Big Mac or a Whopper, but not for long. If you don't believe that, doesn't matter. Denial won't stop what's coming. But wait, Governor Newsom may come to our rescue. Last week, from multiple mainstream sources, California law bans small off-road gas engines, including lawnmowers and chainsaws. From that report, California took another step toward its goal of ridding the state of all gas-powered engines thanks to a new bill signed by Governor Gavin Newsom 
on Saturday. The new law will ban the sale of all off-road gas-powered engines, including generators, lawn equipment, pressure washers, chainsaws, weed trimmers, and even golf carts. Under the new law, these machines must be zero emissions, meaning they will have to be either battery-powered or plug-in, according to the Los Angeles Times. Yeah, you can plug it in and get that electricity that was just produced by a coal-fired power plant. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? This report then states that the California Air Resources Board, CARB, has already started working on executing the law. Thanks, Gavin. Eliminating these meager sources of atmospheric particulate emissions will fix everything. While you and your ilk do all you can to deny and hide the climate engineering insanity that is responsible for literally millions of times more atmospheric particulate pollution with far more toxic elements, starting with aluminum. Gavin, do you remember all the data I presented to you and your top eight in your office at the Capitol? I do. Climate engineering has decimated California. Newsom has done everything to cover up the climate engineering crimes. Question, will an awakened population one day soon hold Newsom legally and morally responsible for his part in this tyranny? One can only hope. Another headline from the Washington Examiner, all related to what's happening in California right now. An example for much of the rest of the world. California farms turn to dust as Newsom and White House policies worsen drought effects. This is where, again, it's imperative to learn enough to recognize when disinformation is being pushed, even from a headline like this. This is where many have taken an off-ramp from reality by subscribing to the same false narratives that this report tries to make. That there is plenty of water, but they say in this report that there is only a shortage because it's being let out of the dams. This narrative is patently false. Yes, water is being let out of the dams, which has always been the case. There is unprecedented drought and water shortage in California and countless other regions around the world because the climate system is broken from countless forms of human activity with climate engineering, a.k.a. weather warfare insanity, at the top of the list. The geoengineers are systematically cutting off the flow of rain into California. This is a satellite image proven fact. The data also backs up this fact. In my location on the east side of Lake Shasta since 2007, we are nearly 500 inches of rain short. That's about 40 feet of rain. That's the problem. That's the primary problem. And it all boils back to climate engineering because you have to have more rain on a warming planet. The laws of physics make this clear. More rain overall on a warming planet. Unless there's a factor that we're not being told about and that factor is climate engineering. Forests and crops are dying by the day in the so-called golden state because of climate engineering primarily. This is not to deny anthropogenic damage to the planet. I have to state this every single time so people don't misconclude what I'm trying to convey. This issue is complex. It's not a this or that scenario. Search the engineering drought and engineering wildfire sections on the homepage of geoengineeringwatch.org to learn more. Next headline, PG&E warns of more blackouts to prevent wildfires. How convenient this is for those in power, conditioning populations to have their power cut off with conditions because of conditions that were created by climate engineering. And as shocking and unbelievable as it may seem to some, wildfires serve many agendas for the climate engineering cabal. Search this title to learn more. Again, one of our most important reports titled Wildfires Serve Geoengineering Agenda. Moving on from the San Francisco Chronicle. This summer was California's driest on record in more than 100 years. Here's what that means. But wait, consider this LA Times report from 2014, titled California Drought Most Severe in 1,200 Years. And this from Time Magazine, also 2014. California's drought is now the worst in 1,200 years. From USA Today, also from way back in 2014, the title, Worst Western Mega Drought in 1,200 Years is Here. As I've stated over and over on so many broadcasts, the data is being systematically falsified, constantly lessened from the severity that it really is. So here we have, seven years ago, acknowledgement by paleo data that this was the worst drought in 1,200 years, and now seven years later, it's only the worst drought in 100 years? Again, 
temperatures being falsified to the downside. Rain records being falsified as well. They're reporting from municipalities and not reporting the radically lessened orographically enhanced rain over mountains, radically less. We're swimming in a sea of lies on every front from the true state of the climate, which is exponentially worse than anything we're officially being told, to the CV-19 scenario, which is anything but what we're being told. Back to the bottom line of biosphere collapse. In 2015, I presented climate engineering data to the California Air Resources Board and a room full of farmers who were being penalized for the atmospheric particulate pollution their farm equipment produced. I was able to get the CARB board members to admit that they have virtually no concern about the mountain of toxic particle pollution being produced by climate engineering operations, particle pollution which includes copious amounts of aluminum, because, according to CARB, these operations are not in their jurisdiction. I made clear to the farmers that they were being made the scapegoats for atmospheric particle pollution that was primarily from other sources, climate engineering being at the top of the list. But perplexingly, so far, the farming community has submitted to the dictates of the power structure puppets on the CARB board without investigating, let alone addressing climate engineering. And now, farmers have no water. Again, climate engineering operations are core to the equation, and still no investigation by the farming community that we know of. Let's go back further to the onset of the unprecedented California dry out and incineration. In 2008, the California Energy Commission called for a meeting to address the lack of rain in the state. The Energy Commission board admitted that 20 to 40 percent of the state's rain was being diminished from falling due to, quote, atmospheric particulates of unknown origin. First, a quick fact on climate science. When there are too many microscopic particles in the atmosphere, specifically mixed into atmospheric flows of moisture, water droplets adhere to the particles and thus don't combine into large enough droplets to fall as rain. The result is days of largely featureless cloud canopy skies with no rain, exactly what we now so often see in California. Next, with all the studies that CARB does, again, the California Air Resources Board, on atmospheric particles over California, how is it possible that they could not account for this mountain of material in our skies? Answer, you can't find what you're told not to look for. And I know this because I've been in a high-level meeting at the state capitol with five top EPA officials who told me to my face that they are told to look for combustion particulates only of a very large size compared to the climate engineering particles. They're told to look for PM 2.5, sometimes generally PM 10, 10 microns, which is a boulder compared to a nanoparticle of climate engineering elements, which might be 20 to 80 nanometers. You can't find, again, what you're not looking for. So at this meeting at the California Energy Commission, I presented climate engineering data to the Energy Commission at their facility at the Capitol in Sacramento. I met with top Energy Commission scientists. The Commission approved the purchase at that meeting of a $200,000 spectrometer from Scripps Institute to determine the chemical composition and origin of the unknown atmospheric particles. This instrument, costing, again, nearly a quarter of a million dollars, has never been seen or heard from since. What a surprise. That's what we're up against systematic corruption, all ultimately linked to those who print the money, the core of the malevolent and malignant matrix. What else is being covered up in California? Last week from fizz.org, this headline, you thought the oil spill was bad? Question mark. In LA, the report states toxic waste is everywhere. I would cover a portion of LA's toxic legacy, but the list is far too long and it doesn't end on land. Recently, as reported on this broadcast, a half million barrels of the highly toxic DDT chemical have been found dumped into the ocean just off the LA coast between LA and Catalina Island. A half a million barrels. In early 1990, on a moonlit night with unusually calm seas, on one of my many small boat journeys across the Catalina Channel to dive and swim with the then abundant sea lions, I believe I came across what may have been a barge engaged in this unconscionable dumping of poison into the sea. I wondered about the event then. When the DDT barrel dumping was finally disclosed earlier this year, the puzzle pieces came together. For the record, if the oceans die, we die. 
Just how dark is the wider horizon? Last week from EcoWatch.com, Earth's largest extinction event saw toxic algae blooms at CO2 concentrations observed today. From that report, the Permian mass extinction event some 252 million years ago, a combination of greenhouse gas emissions from volcanic eruptions, temperature increases, and deforestation created a, quote, poisonous soup of algae that exacerbated an already dire scenario for life. The report then states the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide right before the extinction event stood at 400 parts per million, a little less than the levels observed today. And this doesn't even take into account the skyrocketing atmospheric methane levels now over four times higher than they've been for several million years. And methane, a greenhouse gas that's 120 times more potent than CO2 over a 10 year time horizon. And none of the Climate science models even consider methane because, again, they're trying to downplay the severity and immediacy of damage that's done to the climate, the immediacy of the threat we face. And none of this data bodes particularly well for the current warming event, does it, which is happening hundreds of times faster than any previous mass extinction. But even with that considered, the Permian extinction biodiversity loss the levels of biodiversity did not return for tens of millions of years. This was the great dying, it is called, the worst mass extinction so far in Earth's history. But what is occurring now, mathematically and statistically, again, is far worse with an extinction rate that's a million and a half percent above background rates. And it's happening hundreds of times faster than any previous paleo event. In summary, far too many falsely believe that the damage done to the planet can magically be undone in a matter of a few short years if we just get our act together. Time to wake up. Tens of millions of years is the more correct scenario. And climate engineering operations are a core causal factor to all that's unfolding. Moving on, the La Palma Volcano. This headline, Satellite Captures, quote, Stunning Gravity Waves Over La Palma Eruption. The report states the eruption has not been energetic enough to inject large amounts of ash and gases into the stratosphere, much to the disappointment of the climate engineers, I'm sure, where they can have a strong and lasting effect on the weather and climate. According to Invulcan, that's a monitoring agency, the unusually warm air above the volcano, a temperature inversion, functioned like a lid, preventing the volcanic plume from rising any higher. Instead, it flattened out and spread horizontally. To look at this satellite image and the perfectly symmetrical ripples, atmospheric ripples that were fanning out from a core where the volcano was is very telling. Consider this headline from MIT the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Atmospheric above Japan heated rapidly before the M9 earthquake. Infrared emissions above the epicenter increased dramatically in the days before the devastating earthquake, say scientists. So let's stand back and consider some potential parallels between these two events, between the Fukushima quake and the La Palma eruption. We have what appears to be a signature of extraordinarily powerful microwave transmissions In both scenarios, in the case of the Japan quake, we have MIT acknowledging that for reasons they can't explain, the atmosphere directly above the epicenter heated dramatically and rapidly for three days prior to that quake. We know that technology like the HARP facility, a steerable, extraordinarily powerful microwave transmitter that can bounce its signal off the now reflective atmosphere, an atmosphere that's reflective because of the electrically conductive particles that are being sprayed into the atmosphere by climate engineering operations. And that signal can be bounced off the atmosphere and back down into Earth's strata. That's science fact. What happens when you microwave a seismically sensitive location or a volcanically sensitive location long enough? What happens when you microwave it long enough? What happens when you microwave anything long enough? It expands and eventually can explode. Why would we think that this technology is not possibly being used for things that are so beyond most people's willingness to consider that they simply ignore it all? They ignore the facts. They ignore the science. They ignore the data. And they do so with their own folly because we are on the fast track 
to a lifeless planet. The power structures being run by the clinically insane. They are running the planetary asylum and they have weapons of technology at their disposal that defy what most people can comprehend. I'm asking, I'm begging for all to take the time to research the actual data at hand. Again, we have institutions like the Massachusetts Institute of Technology acknowledging some of this incredibly alarming phenomenon. It begs investigation. Please search this title for a sample of hard data on this subject. Search geoengineeringwatch.org are microwave transmission weapons of mass destruction being used to trigger catastrophic earthquakes. Search that title, read that report, open the hyperlinks in that report, learn about technology that most are not willing to even contemplate that it exists. Moving on, too many dire headlines to cover. I'm already running out of time. Last week from Yahoo News, this. The coldest place on Earth just had its coldest winter on record. And wait, many might say, if the planet's in total meltdown, how can Antarctica just have had its coldest winter on record? First, we're talking about surface temperatures, which are easily manipulated by the climate engineers, and the data relating to those temperatures are also easily manipulated. But there's more to the story, much more. We know that climate engineering and microwave transmissions into the atmosphere are decimating the ozone layer, as is every rocket launch and many other factors related to anthropogenic activity. We know from headlines earlier this year, like this from SciTechDaily.com, the Antarctic ozone hole is among the largest on record. Massive ozone hole over Antarctica. Now let's rewind to this UK Guardian report from December 2009. Antarctica may heat up dramatically as ozone hole repairs, warn scientists. First, we know the ozone hole has not repaired itself. It has gotten worse, not better. This report states, and this is the key part to plug into this equation, as the blanket of ozone over the southern pole seals up, which it didn't do, the report states temperatures on the continent could soar by 3 degrees C. That's almost 6 degrees Fahrenheit, increasing sea level rise by 1.4 meters. The whole in Earth's ozone layer, the UK Guardian report states, has shielded Antarctica from the worst effects of global warming. Why or how, many would ask, because this hole in the atmosphere allows some of the radiant heat and some of the greenhouse gases to escape into the atmosphere. Question, do the climate engineers see this as an advantage? Have they made sure that this ozone hole remains and expands? And back to the wildfires and how that serves the geoengineering agenda, are they that desperate to destroy what's left of Earth's life support systems in the attempt to mask the true severity of what's unfolding until the last possible minute? Yes, they are that insane. Yes, they are that desperate. For any that want the truth, for any that want to decide with their own eyes, with their own sense of reason, what's actually happening in the polar regions, please take the time to view the non-political, award-winning, it's won dozens and dozens of awards, documentary film titled Chasing Ice. You can find it and view it online for, I think, $3, best $3 you would ever spend to learn the truth about what's actually happening to our planet and learn it from film footage so you can decide for yourself. Again, non-political film. And the footage in this film is absolutely beyond shocking. More breaking bad news headlines in a moment. But first, I want to express my deepest gratitude to each and every individual that's doing their best to stay informed, to wake others with credible data from a credible source, and by doing so, helping to turn the tide of insanity. Thank you for making your voices heard in this most critical effort to sound the alarm. It's our collective actions that can yet make a difference. This is Dane Wigington. You're listening to the Global Alert News Hour, episode number 323, October 16th, 2021. This is the bad news broadcast, but it's critically important information that covers the issues we must collectively face if we're to have any chance of changing course. This non-political, commercial-free frontline news broadcast is brought to you by geoengineeringwatch.org and paid for by geoengineeringwatch.org. This news hour is broadcast on AM and FM stations in Northern California, Washington State, on the East Coast, in Alabama, San Antonio, Texas, Tampa, Florida, 
San Francisco, Sacramento, San Diego, Portland, Oregon, Denver, Colorado, and Columbus, Ohio. I want to express my deepest gratitude to all those that have helped geoengineeringwatch.org expand our voice to so many major locations. Those that have helped in this effort know who they are. Recordings of the weekly Global Alert News broadcast can be found at geoengineeringwatch.org under the recent top stories and radio sections. The latest geoengineeringwatch.org awareness raising materials can be ordered from our homepage for our approximate cost of producing and shipping. Our color glossy flyers and booklets are packed with shocking satellite images, documents, patents, photos of the retrofit spray nozzles mounted on climate engineering aircraft. The list goes on. Again, our only goal is to sound the alarm as effectively and efficiently as possible. On that note, the recently completed geoengineeringwatch.org documentary on climate engineering titled The Dimming conclusively proves climate engineering operations are ongoing. This groundbreaking documentary is now posted on the top center of the geoengineeringwatch.org homepage. Please help us to overcome social media censorship and to expose the insanity in our skies by sharing the link to this groundbreaking documentary that fully exposes the ongoing climate engineering onslaught. Sharing the link for the documentary directly from geoengineeringwatch.org through email helps us to overcome the attempt of the controllers to censor the dimming documentary and geoengineeringwatch.org data. If you live anywhere near Santa Rosa, California, on October 22nd through October 24th, the GEM Fair Group, G-E-M-F-A-I-R-E, will hold an event at the Sonoma County Fairgrounds. At each GEM Fair event, there is a geoengineeringwatch.org informational booth with free geoengineeringwatch.org materials. If you're near Santa Rosa, California, again, October 22nd through the 24th, please attend the GEM Fair event, show your support for this group that has been such a staunch ally in the fight to expose and halt climate engineering operations, and you can get free geoengineeringwatch.org materials there. Moving on, what is our greatest and most immediate threat? A threat to which CB19 was a response. Almost none are in any way acknowledging, let alone addressing, unfolding and accelerating biosphere collapse. Why not? This background factor that is the fundamental factor on which all of our futures completely and immediately depend is being completely ignored by almost all, as if endless money printing, new cars that can be bought with nothing down, and Walmart supercenters are all we need to survive, which of course couldn't be further from the truth. Brace for impact. It's coming. You can quote me on that. Let's cover the weather, in this case, the U.S. weather. First, this from AccuWeather. Warm, warmer, warmest. Eastern U.S. in midst of summer throwback. The report states record-challenging heat is expected to roast the U.S. Northeast. But don't worry, a weather whiplash engineered cool-down will be right on the heels of the record heat. Another headline, Central U.S. to feel the bitter bite of weather whiplash. In this case, they're saying it, not me. This report states it's time to go find those winter jackets. A major cool-down is in store for the Central United States. A quick footnote, where did much of the moisture come from for this, quote, major cool-down? straight from the record warm Gulf of Mexico. Imagine that. The AccuWeather report then states, temperatures are likely to quickly rebound after this cool spell. This will mean above average temperatures returning immediately to the central states. Yes, welcome to engineered winter weather whiplash via patented processes of cloud seeding with chemical ice nucleating elements. Search the engineering winter section on the top of the geoengineeringwatch.org homepage. About Northern California, the weather makers have scheduled a bit of rain for the droughted out and incinerated North State. But will any significant precipitation actually occur? There's no way to know, unless or until it happens. All too often, the scheduled precipitation over Northern California amounts to a few days of off and on uniform drizzle. Sometimes a very sudden and unnatural feeling cold drizzle when ice nucleating elements are being seeded into cloud moisture. These endothermic, i.e. energy absorbing materials, are desiccants, which means much of the rain that would have fallen and should have fallen doesn't. Further, for the last decade, after specific rains in the fall, the leaves on most of the deciduous trees suddenly die and dry out to a crisp while still hanging on the trees. For the record, this is not an act of nature. This is a telling sign of defoliance likely being utilized to create the public perception of a change of season, when in reality, a true natural extended surface cooldown has not occurred. The abscission hormone of the trees has not triggered the leaves to fall intact, though discolored, as has historically been the case for time immemorial. Some would say the use of defoliants that force deciduous trees into dormancies 
are not possible to use on such a vast scale. Those who cling to such denial perhaps are unaware that the U.S. military was defoliating entire jungles over 50 years ago with Agent Orange. What is the depth of their technology now? We can't fully know, but as the coming weeks tick by, look for trees that have stone dead leaves hanging all over them. This is not an act of nature. About the rest of the world, snapshots of the same. Engineered weather chaos is further fueling the rapid unraveling of our planet's already heavily damaged climate system. While keeping in mind that our breathable air column is being completely contaminated with highly toxic climate engineering elements like aluminum, let's consider the following peer-reviewed science study title report, which can be found in multiple science publications, including SCIRP.org. It's titled, Aluminum and Glyphosate Can Synergistically Induce Penal Gland Pathology connection to gut dysbiosis and neurological disease. From that report, many neurological diseases, including autism, depression, dementia, anxiety disorder, and Parkinson's disease are associated with abnormal sleep patterns, which are directly linked to penal gland dysfunction. The penal gland is highly susceptible to environmental toxicants. Two pervasive substances in modern industrialized nations are aluminum and glyphosate, the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup. This science study shows how these two Toxins work synergistically to induce neurological damage. Glyphosate chelates aluminum, allowing ingested aluminum to bypass the gut barrier. This leads to anemia-induced hypoxia, promoting neurotoxicity and damaging the penile gland. The contamination of our biosphere is ubiquitous, from the elements just named, and literally tens of thousands more. Truly, it's a wonder any still survive. Many have justifiably compared the behavior of the human race as a whole and the current trajectory of our species to the scenario that took place on Easter Island. The Easter Island population decimated their habitat. Much of that destruction was to build idols, massive statues which the inhabitants of the island erected all over their former paradise. The palm trees on the island, thought to number as high as 16 million at peak, were cut down to use as rollers for the statues. The palms were the primary food source for the islanders. Question, what was running through their minds as they cut down the last palm tree, took a look around and realized what they'd done? Total collapse and eventual cannibalism ensued. Such is the behavior of too many in the ranks of the human race. Now at aluminum, fluoride, programming, propaganda, we are truly in trouble. Here's another example, same theme, titled The Country That Killed Itself. The floundering fortunes and fate of a small island in the Pacific may seem to be removed from our reality, but in fact, there are ominous parallels to the unfolding fate of the entire human race. Just as was the case with Easter Island. Nauru is a tiny island spanning 22 kilometers. It was rich in phosphates, which were mined mercilessly and unsustainably. After over a century of being exploited by foreign powers from the early 1900s, following Nauru's acquisition of independence, it continued mining and exporting phosphates, and its fortunes skyrocketed. In 1974, Nauru had the second highest GDP per capita in the world, three times higher than that of the United States. A super generous welfare system was set up, consumerism took off, and all seemed to be going well. But for how long? The phosphate deposits ran out. Up to 80% of the land cover had been destroyed because of the mining. Some 40% of the marine animals around the island had been killed. Since much of the island looked like an industrial wasteland, it couldn't fall back on alternative sources of revenue, such as tourism. The real estate investments that the government had made in anticipation of such a crisis weren't successful. The residents on the island had been weaned on the typically rich diets of hyper-consumeristic society and the majority were obese. Strapped for cash, the island turned to dodgy sources of revenue, money laundering, selling passports, and even acting as a holding pin or detention center for refugees, some of whom preferred to stay on board a ship rather than land on the ravaged wasteland they could see. That, in a nutshell, is how Nauru earned the nickname, the country which ate itself. And now this is happening on a planetary scale. The human race must completely and totally alter its current course, or, like the inhabitants of Nauru, we will very soon have nothing left to salvage. What can we do? How can we most effectively and efficiently pass data on to others without putting up their defenses? Defenses that have been fortified by decades of power structure, media propaganda, and programming, and 
peer pressure to conform with the groupthink herd mentality of normalcy bias. Another nugget from Eric Hoffer, who said this, all mass movements strive, therefore, to interpose a fact-proof screen between the faithful and the realities of the world. They do this by claiming that the ultimate and absolute truth is already embodied in their doctrine, and that there is no truth, no certitude outside it. The facts on which the true believer bases his conclusions must not be derived from his experience or observation, but rather from holy writ, i.e., the official narrative the officially labeled so-called science, the official lies and or official denial, often regarding glaring truths that can be seen with one's own eyes. Yet, the denial of dire existential truths and existential threats continues, again, because the denial is officially sanctioned and required to be an accepted member of the majority herd. If we are to have any chance of extending our stay on this formerly thriving planet, the trajectory of the human race must be completely altered, starting with exposing and halting the ongoing and accelerating climate engineering assault. The only way forward in this fight is to reach a critical mass of awareness in the population, a level of awareness in which populations realize they are literally fighting for their very survival now. Though a tidal wave is looming over us all, we must not We cannot allow ourselves to become overwhelmed. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, as the proverb goes. We must focus on priorities, on the biggest hole in the bottom of the boat, on the greatest and most immediate threat we collectively face, short of nuclear cataclysm, which can also in many ways be connected to climate engineering. Not only are climate engineering operations decimating what is yet left of the planet's remaining life support systems, the atmospheric spraying from these operations are contaminating every breath we take and inflaming our respiratory systems, making us all much more susceptible to any and every form of pathogen. Further, at any point of the controller's choosing, they can alter the composition of the atmospheric particulate spraying to something much more lethal. Game over. Again, we must prioritize exposing and halting the insanity in our skies, which is the greatest single leap we can collectively make in the right direction. Start and stoke the fires of awareness in your individual circles. Excessive and emotional verbal communications can be, and all too often are, counterproductive. Plant seeds and move on. Check the activist suggestions link on the homepage of geoengineeringwatch.org to learn more about how you can help in this all-important battle Share credible data from a credible source. Make your voice heard. Make every day count. Until next week, stay safe, stay strong. This is Dane Wigington with geoengineeringwatch.org.